Thank you, man. Yep. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll try to do those three things. I'm going to try to entertain too, because otherwise I have no fun with this whatsoever, right? Um, this is, I did not know what was a distinguished lecture that I was being asked to give. I don't, I, I don't feel distinguished, you know? I mean, I'm a young guy. Um, but I, I, it is certainly not my first, it is, I think it's my first distinguished lecture for the Foreign Policy Association. It is absolutely not my first lecture. But, I mean, I love this, it's a great group. Uh, what you guys do is fantastic. Um, the fact that we can turn out a couple hundred uh, New Yorkers uh, when there is everything under the sun available for us every single evening and all the time to talk about global issues, the very important thing. And of course, it's something FPA does all over the country, which is fantastic. So as much as long as I can, I will be a supporter. Um, and, and, and I've known Noel for, I don't know, 15 years, I think, and uh, Gary for 10. So between the two of them, 25, that's not bad, that's not bad. Um, look, so I wanna talk about, I'm gonna talk about my book, uh, but what I'm really talking about with the book is uh, the fact that I do not believe that we have a foreign policy strategy. Um, I, and more importantly than that, I, I think that we no longer know what we stand for globally. Um, and this is not new, and it's not particularly news, except that it's becoming important. And it didn't used to be as important. I think it's been evolving for 25 years. Uh, since the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, that was when suddenly we could say, you know what, it's not as important, we'll be more risk averse, we will react. And in the last 25 years, I mean, if you look at the damage that's been done to the United States and the threats, by far the largest was not perpetrated by another country or a terrorist, it was the overreaction of after 9-11 the extraordinary economic and human cost, both for Americans and also for allies and for adversaries, and just for bystanders, um, is, is enormous. And we're all paying for it. Uh, our, our kids are paying for it. We're paying for the legacy of that. And it's limiting our ability to act uh, in the world today. Um, I think it's interesting that um, in the electoral cycle in 2016, Obama's actually doing pretty well right now, right? He's at, what, he's at 51, 52 percent, I believe, when I looked yesterday, which is uh, for a president six and a half years in is perfectly respectable. Uh, his numbers on handling the economy are perfectly respectable. His numbers on health care are perfectly respectable. His numbers on foreign policy are a disaster, right? And they have been. Um, Americans who don't care about foreign policy are actually focusing on this. We have candidates who have said they are running because they want to focus on foreign policy. I've never seen that. I mean, you might see that in Singapore, right, if they had a proper democracy, uh, or um, in, in Canada, but you're not gonna see it in the United States. You had Lindsey Graham actually coming out, right, a couple days ago saying that if you don't want war, don't vote for me. I, I think most Americans will hear that. They will, I think they'll follow through on his wishes. I think, I think most Americans will not vote for Lindsey Graham. That's fairly safe, right? That's safe. But nonetheless, just the conversation, just the conversation is so interesting to have. And it's not just Americans. I mean, you know, I travel around the world, and, and I've gone and met with both, you know, in some cases the heads of state, but in every case the foreign minister, of all of our key allies in the past months in Japan, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, um, in Singapore, in Canada, in Britain, in Germany, in France. And I will tell you that every single one of them wonders what we're doing. Are we committed? What do we want in the world? Where are we going? How committed should they be? Right? There, there's a lot of hedging behavior going on as a consequence, and hedging that we haven't seen historically. Like when the Americans tell the Brits, do not join the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank because it is a threat and a competitor to the US-led World Bank, and our special relationship, the Brits said, actually, we're gonna join. Because what are you gonna do about it? And then everyone joins except like Japan, right, and Canada. Uh, and then after the IMF declares that actually the Chinese RMB is no longer undervalued, and we say we disagree with that, and we tell the Canadians, stick with us on this one, the Canadians are like, no, we think it's actually fine. 
In fact, we'd like to do more business in RMB. Or when our Gulf allies, we invite them for a summit in Washington a few weeks ago, and a week before, four of the six call us up and say, actually, we're not coming. Or when the Israeli prime minister, we ask him not to come, and he shows up. <laughs> it's hard, right? But the fact is, that it's fairly obvious that the behavior of allies, the willingness they have to say no, to go other directions, the Turks buying missile systems from China when they're a NATO ally, and that doesn't really work, or the Dutch, a NATO ally, going to Huawei, say, please build our internet backbone. This is all new, and, and it's, it's coming from a world, let me be clear, I don't think the U.S. is in decline. I really don't, and I say this in the book. I, I think that if you look at the role of the dollar, 80% of all financial transactions in the world, you look at the world's largest oil and gas producer, largest food producer, most extraordinary innovation in the world, promising demographics, 34% of the world's defense spending, United States of America, no one else remotely close. I mean, people want to put their money in American markets, American treasuries, American equities. This is not a country in decline. I don't buy it. But our foreign policy influence is in decline. Absolutely it is. And for the last 50 years, Americanization and globalization were largely proceeding hand in glove. Globalization is continuing. We are continuing to see money and ideas and trade flow past borders faster and faster and faster. Americanization is not. The worst thing that I can say to you today, I think, the thing that is most unnerving to me is that I believe that today there is one country in the world that has a global strategy, one country of size, China. How is that possible? How is that possible? And, and furthermore, I don't think that's even part of the discussion right now. I mean, we have The Economist this week with their lead cover piece saying the Americans are getting out of the Middle East and that's a disaster, they have to come back. We don't have The Economist saying, oh my God, China has a strategy, America doesn't, right? It's, it's all the problems from five years ago, 10 years ago. The fact is, China is not gonna threaten us militarily, and they know it, <laughs> but economically, economically. China's spending over a trillion dollars, and they're spending it on other countries in Asia and around the world, mostly, but not all emerging markets. And they're doing it because they want to align those countries with long-term Chinese commercial interests. They're laying fiber so that more company, countries will use Chinese internet and Chinese providers. They want to support Chinese state-owned corporations. They want to support Chinese currency. And I'm not suggesting that these countries around the world are simply gonna say, okay, that's enough with the United States, we're gonna go to China, China's a new ally, they won't. But countries that before were aligned with US-led global standards are gonna hedge. And that's a problem for us. Now, we, we've done this ourselves, we do, we know because we've done it. We did it after World War II, we spent 4% of our GDP on the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan actually aligned what we thought was gonna be the most important economic and political space in the world, align them with us, help to rebuild them so that they would develop support for international architecture and institutions that would in turn promote a global free market that was very much in America's economic interest. It was a lot of money, 4% of the GDP, but it was probably the best investment the US has made in 100 years from just an economic long-term investment perspective. Now, there is nobody running for president that is gonna suggest doing another Marshall Plan. And yet, China, which doesn't have elections, is actually doing precisely that. And the difference, of course, the Chinese Marshall Plan is not about building democracy. It's not about building free markets. It is about long-term strategic alignment. And so the fact that we've had a US-led global economy with American global standards, and suddenly China, which will be the largest economy in the world in the next five to 10 years, is developing an alternative, is something we need to talk about. And given that the next president will probably be around for eight years, this is gonna happen under that person. So we better know what they're gonna do. And that's why I wrote the book. It's not only about that, it's also about ISIS, it's also about Ukraine, but let's also be clear 
I think we don't have a strategy. And what I mean by that is that our words are not connected to outcomes. So we have said Assad must go. We haven't said how that might happen or who is going to remove him, but Assad must go. ISIS must be destroyed. Absolutely. Great sentiment. All in favor. Right? But uh, we did not say that the U.S. is going to destroy ISIS, just that it must be destroyed. It's kind of like this existential thing. Right? Putin must leave Ukraine. Okay. It sounds, it sounds great. Unless you think I'm just beating on Obama. How about North Korea must not develop nuclear weapons? That, how did that work out for us? Right? Um, and and the, the issue is that, I mean, you can talk a harder line. You can talk about the fact that, I mean, Jeb Bush in Europe now and saying, no, 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 we have to be much more assertive with Russia. But we can't push them towards the Chinese. Well, OK. That sounds great. Please tell me how you're going to do that. I've had this conversation with John McCain. John McCain, who believes that we have to, when we say that we are going to punish the Russians, we have to punish the Russians. We say we're going to isolate them, we have to isolate them. And so my response is, OK, so what you mean, since China is actually the biggest breaker of sanctions, they're doing much more business with Russia, that that means that we should be sanctioning China when they do that, right? And so we'd have to talk about that. And I'm like, oh, I mean, talk about it in the sense that since that doesn't work, that you'll change your policy? That kind of talk about it? And he didn't answer that. Um, and, right? So we, we absolutely um, need to understand um, what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think that there are, I'm not someone who believes there's only one way forward. We are the world's only superpower. That is not going to change anytime soon. China is going to be the largest economy. They will not be a superpower. They will not challenge the Americans militarily um, or be competitive globally uh, in, in the military sphere. They will not be able to be as competitive technologically. They will not have the global soft power, the diplomatic capabilities. They will not be a global superpower. But they will be able to prevent the United States from taking action in lots of places. No one else is going to do this role. So I don't believe the United States only has one option. And I lay out three. And I try to argue them as strongly as I can. And I do that because um, when I wrote the book, I actually didn't know which one I preferred. And when I wrote the conclusion, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to write, because I didn't think it was fair to the reading audience to not tell you, after having gone through this entire exercise, it's just up to you. I have no guidance. So I will take a few minutes to walk you through each of these three, and then I'll tell you what I ended up saying. And so then I guess you don't have to buy the book. You know, it's not. Um, but the first is the one that will be most you know, sort of easily uh, digestible, because we've been doing it for a while, indispensable America. And indispensable America, the idea behind it is, look, I know we don't want to be the world's policemen. But if we do not provide leadership, it is abundantly clear that no one else will. And we see this in Ukraine, and we see it in the Middle East, and we see it with the South China Sea, and we see it with cyber, we see it on climate, we see it everywhere. NATO, you name it. And, and so what that means is that we actually have to provide support for our allies. And if the Europeans aren't going to pay for NATO, we're going to support it anyway. And if the Saudis aren't going to do the lifting around ISIS, we're going to be there to work to ensure that we are building a coalition to actually destroy ISIS over the long term. And we're going to keep the coalitions. And furthermore, we're going to promote our values internationally. And we know that we're not going to make everyone a democracy tomorrow. We know that the Chinese aren't going to accept a free market economy tomorrow. But if we don't promote those values, no one else will. And ultimately, that won't just be bad for other countries, it'll be bad for us because we all live in this world. That is indispensable America. And if you look at the presidential candidates today, I would say that we have a couple that are trying to talk that. I think Rubio is probably the one who is talking that the most consistently. Um, certainly Lindsey Graham, Pataki would be in that camp. It's early. 
um, and they haven't said much of substance in terms of details. You wouldn't expect them to. This is not meant to be criticism. Um, second idea, second policy, Moneyball America. And Moneyball America, I ripped off from Michael Lewis, right? And he wrote it. Um, and the idea, it's, it's Billy Bean, it's the Oakland A's, is a completely unsentimental foreign policy. It's saying, look, we, the values were great while they worked, but if you look around the world today, we know that there are very few countries that want to listen to the Americans lecture them on human rights and free market capitalism. So we should stop doing that, right? And we should not try to be the world's policeman. Everyone else is playing Moneyball. The Chinese are playing Moneyball, right? The Germans are playing Moneyball, the Brits. It is time for the world's largest economy to play Moneyball because we can do it better than anyone else. So we can win playing Moneyball. And what that means is we focus on those policies that are gonna give the biggest return to the United States. And we're going all in there. And if that means supporting big alliances, this yes. So that means a real pivot to Asia. And when I say a real pivot to Asia, an actual pivot means that the foot that you had in one place actually moves. So if you used to do a lot of Middle East, you stop. You don't spend 18 months doing Israel-Palestine for reasons that I cannot fathom, right? You don't say that you're gonna do all of this work in Iraq and Syria when your allies on the ground are not prepared to do the lifting. And if your allies in Europe want to support NATO, you're really going to get behind NATO. But if they don't, I guess NATO's not that important. I'm really sorry, Ukraine. Right? That, that is Moneyball. Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, was a Moneyballer. Right? I mean, she's the one that actually said, you can't really lecture your banker on human rights, talking about China. She's the one that wanted the reset with Russia because Russia was in decline, she didn't want to spend a lot of time there. She's the one that did Libya, reluctantly. The Arab League begged to take out Gaddafi, begged the Americans, we said no. Then the Gulf Council Cooperation Council, the GCC, we said no. And then the Brits, and then the French, and then finally, as Gaddafi was engaging in more and more atrocities, the US said, you know what? We're prepared to do it, but very limited. We don't want to have a lot of military exposure, we're not going to spend a lot of money, and we're sure as hell not going to rebuild Libya afterwards, because we know how hard that is. And you can look at Libya today and say it's a disaster, but you can't really blame America for that. This wasn't America's policy, right? I mean, what, what, Norway was involved in bombing, why didn't they take some of these people? Oh, sorry, Norwegian Foreign Minister said the other day, I don't want to do that. We really had a very small role. Um, Americans didn't lose a single person during the fighting. Benghazi was later. Um, and, and then you look, at, um, the, uh, you, you look at the pivot to Asia. And again, not perfectly implemented, but the Asian focus very clear, the desire to do the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to put more troops on the ground there, to move defense in that area. Now, two things that are interesting. One, while I think that Hillary Clinton did have a strategy that looked like Moneyball, Obviously, some of those policies didn't work, so implementation was problematic and uneven. But secondly, Hillary as candidate has run away from those things, which we can talk about in questions if you want. Um, some of those are, are understandable, some of them are really not. Um, so that's Moneyball. Third possibility says that indispensable and Moneyball sound fine. In fact, they sound really good. But if you are not prepared to actually deliver, actually follow through, then you should stop lying to people. And therefore, you should say, we're not going to have red lines. We should do what we did in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, you had a clear abrogation of the rights of Hong Kong. There was a transfer that was given by the Brits and the Chinese promised that they were going to respect over time the democratic vo volition, the suffrage of Hong Kong Chinese. But that was when Hong Kong was 14% of China's GDP. Today it's 2.5%. And so China changed the rules. And the Americans looked and we said, wow, we're really concerned about that. Very Ban Ki-moon kind of statement, right? We didn't, we didn't do anything. And we didn't lead the Hong Kong Chinese to believe that we were going to do anything. So it was not on us. 
Independent says, do not lie to the Ukrainians. Don't send over lots of people and say you're going to help them and then not help them. You're not going to give them money. You're not going to back the Russians down because then the death of 6,000 Ukrainians is actually on you to a greater degree. Don't say you're going to destroy ISIS. You're not. Instead, focus on the areas, the things that you really are going to do. So if you're going to do cyber surveillance, you do cyber surveillance. You're going to go and take out someone who's a threat to you, CFO of ISIS, go for it. Use 21st century tools like the weaponization of finance. Right? Independent is not isolationist, it's unilateralist. It's that the Americans are not doing things for other countries the way they used to. And furthermore, the independent is about leading by example. It says that unlike Moneyball, American values matter. But unlike indispensable, we're not going to apply them internationally. We're going to apply them domestically. We're actually going to try to lead by example. So that means, for example, that we're not going to fix Syria, but we might actually accept more than 355 Syrians out of the 4 million that are refugees right now because we have a Statue of Liberty that none of the presidential candidates talk about, right? So those kinds of things. Now, those are the three options. And I would argue that um, Bernie Sanders and Rand Paul are the two candidates that talk most um, about an independent America. So those are the three. Now, I, I strongly believe that all three of these are doable. And I furthermore believe that all three of these could have a leader that could stand up for it. And I say that because, look, I know that Washington is broken. I know we don't believe in Washington anymore. I know that legislation doesn't happen. I know that even if you wanted to fix health care, and I personally believe that universal health care is a good thing, but I also believe that universal health care should be something we can pay for and is sustainable over the long term. And I think the idea that any presidential candidate would be able to take on the AARP and Big Pharma in the American system is zero. I accept that. I accept it. I wouldn't even try. I accept the idea that even after the tragedy in Newtown, that the idea that a candidate was going to go after and get rid of the NRA and entrenched interests was not going to happen. I accept that. And we can, we can uh, capital gains tax. I accept that. That's what billionaires are for, right, is to ensure that that issue maintains itself so the 0.01% can pay less than the 1%. I get it. Don't try. But on foreign policy, you actually have, number one, it's not partisan. You have Democrats and Republicans that both don't know what to do. And they're all over the map ideologically, right? Furthermore, Congress doesn't have much influence. And moneyed interests just aren't that strong. They're much more diffuse. Think about what Obama has been able to do in foreign policy for good and for bad, despite the fact that most strong moneyed interests in America wouldn't have wanted those outcomes. So I actually do believe that in 2016, we could end up with a candidate it could really make a difference on this issue, and that's a big deal. And that, that does imply that it's really important to start a debate, because we know that foreign policy is going to be discussed. We see Obama's ratings. We see what the candidates are starting to talk about. We know that Hillary was Secretary of State, so she's vulnerable in terms of her attachment to Obama on that issue. But we also know she has a lot that she will say about these topics when she finally decides to start giving speeches on them, um, which will start, I think, this weekend. Um, it means that this, is a, that this is an issue that deserves attention now. So I promised you before I would open to questions that I'd tell you which one I came out with. I'll tell you which one I came out with. I surprised myself. Uh, it was independent. And I don't like independent. Uh, I'll tell you that indispensable um, really uh, strikes a chord with my heart. And Moneyball obviously strikes a chord with my ambitions and my career. Um, and, and indispensable and independent ultimately is more with my rational thought process. But it's not the America that I want to live in. Um, the problem is that I don't think a strategy is for today. I think a strategy is for 5, 10, 20 years. It's something that actually sets the tone of the kind of America that we are going to live in. 
And there are a couple of reasons I ended up going with independent. Um, one reason is because I think the world is becoming much more challenging for the Americans to act effectively indispensable. Um, China's getting stronger. Uh, Non-state actors are becoming more disruptive. Allies are hedging more. And in that environment, the United States, if it wants to be indispensable, will have to pick up a larger and larger and larger piece. It is not clear to me that the American people are prepared to support that long term. Um, secondly, um, what worries me about Moneyball is if a country like the United States is only making a few really large bets in a world that is very geopolitically unstable, the likelihood that you make the wrong such bets and you put yourself in a weaker position is a problem. Moneyball works really well for companies. Works really well for the Oakland A's because if you're a company, you make lots of bets, and if some of those bets go really wrong, well, I mean, worst comes to worst, you go bankrupt, you start another company, right? That's how you bet on portfolios. You're maximizing shareholder return. But shareholder return is different from return from American citizens. And so as a consequence, I think that the money ball approach is a little too risky for the United States over the long term. Again, I could get behind either of these. But the main reason I ended up with independent is because I do not see a realistic candidate that I believe is prepared to actually not just wrap themselves in the flag, but actually implement on Moneyball and Indispensable. So independent is a bit of a challenge for me. It's a challenge that says, I've done the best analysis I can, and I don't actually think there's anybody out there that's really going to do either of these other two things. And I know that we have to stop lying to the allies because it's making it worse. Because if you're in a relationship with someone, a husband, a wife, or whatever, something, or family member, and, and suddenly something's happened, the relationship has changed. And, and they know it. And, and they ask you, what's wrong? And you say, nothing, nothing. Everything is the same. Everything's fine. Well, you know, they know that something has changed. And furthermore, if you say that nothing has changed, they're going to think it is much worse than it was. Oh my God, he has cancer. Right? Right? Oh my God, it's an affair. Oh my, right? It's something horrible. And when reality, like, so in other words, the reaction is going to be vastly worse than it would have been if you actually were able to follow through. I think the fact is, if we're going to end up in a position where we talk big, but we act small, we have to actually start right-sizing our aspirations. That doesn't mean that we are, and, and one final point is that I fear that the most important thing out there, which is China, the decision of whether or not the Chinese ultimately make it has less to do with the United States than does with what happens in China. And ultimately, the way to get China on side is less to contain them or to threaten them with a stick than to do such a great job as the United States that they all desperately want to come to America. They all want to invest here. They want to be educated here. And those values start to actually rub off. The biggest downside with independent is that in the near term, independence is going to make the world worse, right? Because we're basically saying you guys have to do it, and yet those guys aren't willing to do it. I mean, you need the Saudis to actually go to the mullahs in their country and say, we are not going to tolerate you proselytizing radical Islam anymore. There are going to be real consequences, and they're not willing to do it. And, and, and if the Americans abdicate, in the near term, it's going to get worse. In the long term, there's more likelihood that you'll get more responsibility and accountability from other actors that truly understand that they're going to have to do it themselves, much more themselves. And yes, I understand that these are ideal types, and of course, you would react in different ways as policies hit you. But, the, but it's not like you get to pick and choose. We do need a strategy. We do need a mission. We had one when the Soviet Union was around. We were keeping the world safe from communism. We were supporting democracy. We were supporting free markets. I went to the Soviet Union in 1986, my first trip to any country outside the United States ever. And it was astonishing at the time to see Voice of America and Radio for Europe. I don't believe that the way we beat the Soviets was through building our defense. I don't think it was Star Wars that led Gorbachev to understand he, could, understand he couldn't do it anymore. I think a part of it was that the Gorbachev reformed too much too fast and it all fell apart. But part of it was that the people of the Eastern Bloc understood that there was really a better model out there, a much better model out there, and they believed in it. 
And what, I'm, what worries me more than anything else looking around the world today is despite the fact that the U.S. isn't in decline, despite the fact that we have so many advantages and are by far the wealthiest country in the world, despite all of that, that our values no longer appeal in the way that they did to so many other countries in the world, in part because we're seen as not living up to them ourselves. And I think that gets so much worse if we don't actually figure this out real soon. So that's a little bit of the book. That's a little bit of how I feel about these things. I found it extremely interesting to see the reaction of the country over the last couple weeks as it's come out. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing yours as well. Uh, I'd be delighted to take any questions. If you also want to tell us, talk briefly about which of the three you think you actually, these categories you fit yourself into and why. What I really, if there's anything that I hope you guys will do after this, it's have discussions about it. Right? And whether you buy the book or not, I mean, frankly, steal it. I don't care. It's not about the money. But I'd like you to just to, to get into each of these ideas and actually say, because it was hard for me, and I spent my entire life doing this, I'd, I'd like to know, as you think about it, what you think America should stand for. Because these are, this, we, have to, we have to answer these questions. We really do. I'll start over here. Do we have uh, mics that are roving? Good. OK, so if you wait till the mic comes. And then we'll get it to you. And I have two questions over here to start. Yeah. Okay. And the first one was right over here. Right. Oh, OK. And the second one was where? The second one. Who's the second mic? Second one's right there. Hi, John, Jonathan Honig. Um, listen with interest. I've always thought and understood power to be relative. And in relative terms, clearly, I think your premise is faulty because our relative power has declined dramatically. And the last statement that you made, I also from the experience of all of our children dealing all over the world, would also say is a faulty premise. China is sitting with $3 trillion in the bank. We have a kitty where we're $16 trillion in the hold, where we can't get past a, a penny of additional taxation or funding from Congress. So our financial uh, firepower to deal with anything in the world seems to me is very, very limited, whereas China has essentially unlimited capability and continues to show it all over the world in investing, doing with Venezuela, doing with every country in, Cong uh, in Africa, in all the countries in Asia, uh, including India, that they're omnipresent in enormous investments and enormous concentrations of effort to, as you said, align countries' interests with them. So I go from the premise that, uh, that our relative power has declined dramatically. And what I'd submit to you is that I don't think that any of your three models are the model. The model is of a mediator. What we can do is, in a group of equals, we can be a voice that since it still has a significant residue of all the assets you referred to, it can be a voice at the table to try and push people in the right direction. So it's what we've done in Ukraine. It's what we did with Qatar and Lib bombing in Libya. It's what we're doing with Saudi Arabia in Yemen. We can be a supportive, mediative uh, influence. And that is a coherent policy. And the talk of there not being a coherent policy, I think, is mistaken. What the policy has been very clearly is to see where we can utilize our, our assets to accomplish things through the mediation of other, uh, of other actors and to get them to, to the extent possible, to build coalitions to deal with each of the hotspots in, uh, in the world, and that that is the only policy that's admissible now and for, as you said, the next five to 10 years, because we know that we're going to be in a steadily declining position vis-a-vis -vis China, and the only thing we can do is to try and use our soft power to, and our mediative power is still the largest player in a gang of seven dwarfs uh, to, uh, to see what we can accomplish rather than doing anything unilateral uh, in the world. Um, so, I mean, I, a lot of things I can respond to there. Um, I, I don't think that my premises were particularly different from the way you raised them. I mean, if we define the fact that I said American foreign policy influence was in decline, but that the United States as a country and economy is not, you cannot look at America's relative position in things like technology or energy production or food production or our demographics. Um, you can't look um, at uh, U.S. in terms of its military today. You can't look at the, uh, the relative attraction of the U.S. dollar and actually say that the U.S. is in decline. I mean, that, the facts just don't stand for that. Now, I accept that, um, that the world is becoming much more multipolar, um, but we're not there yet. 
Um, and, and I also think that, you know, the, the, fact, the fact that, I also said that China's influence is clearly growing by using the economic tool. Um, again, I, I agree with you on that. And you look at it, there's no question. I don't think that the fact that the U.S. is indebted to China is such a vulnerability. In fact, in some ways, it's, well, you know the old saying, if you owe someone 100 bucks, it's your problem. If you owe them a billion bucks, it's their problem. There's a mutually assured economic destruction between the United States. I, I'm sure you know that. So, I mean, I, I mean, it's fun to be provocative with a question in my response. Um, but um, but I, I think we actually, there's not that much difference there. Um, in terms of the role of the United States a, a, as, as a mediator, Oh, and by the way, one of the reasons why I raised this, why I say we're not in decline, is because I do actually fear that if we don't respond to China, and if we allow our allies to continually hedge, and if we have a continually incoherent response, I think the likelihood that China will emerge as a serious currency that people will put real money into, and that the role of the dollar will be in decline in 10 or 20 years' time, where today it's 80% of all transactions, and gives us extraordinary benefit by, be, by being so, that does actually worry me. So I think we could end up in a position where the premise that you say is false actually is false. And I think that's a concern. Um, the, the mediator role, I, I would, I'd certainly not argue that we've been effective in the mediator role recently, and I'd say that again because our allies all say we're ineffective um, in a way that they haven't necessarily said we've been ineffective historically, and it's getting much more challenging. Um, I mean, you look again at Israel-Palestine, and Kerry spent literally 14 trips to both places, making it the single highest priority of his entire role as Secretary of State, and it went absolutely nowhere. And in fact, U.S.-Israel relations now are worse than they were, and U.S.-Palestinian relations are worse than they were. Now, I do believe that the U.S. has not failed in a mediator role everywhere. Um, there's no question that on Iran, the United States has built a relatively viable coalition, and they are moving towards getting a deal done. I suspect some of you like that deal, and some of you hate that deal. It doesn't really matter. The fact is it will be seen by most of American allies, not in the region, but Europeans and others, as a successful conclusion of the United States in terms of bringing the end to a conflict. But let's keep in mind, here the America wasn't really, really mediating, America was leading. And, and But the final point I want to make, and one where I think I do dis actually disagree with you, is that I think one of the places America has become most interesting in changing its orientation in the world is its unilateralism. And, and I say that because look at FIFA. FIFA is one of the biggest successes the United States has had as a leader in the global environment. It was absolutely not mediating. It had no support from allies. It was doing it all by itself. I mean, in fact, after the United States did it, and it was obvious that everyone was going down, Blatter still won the election. Not only that, but the Ukrainians, who wouldn't even have a government if it wasn't for the US at this point, right? I mean, actually voted with Putin, which is insane, right? And, 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 and yet that's because you know, everyone was in it for themselves. They were all lining their pockets. Everyone got a little from FIFA, except the United States, because we don't care about soccer, but we do actually have banks that really matter. The role of the American banks and the dollar is so strong that we will use, we will weaponize finance to go after people. And we've done it with FIFA. We've done it with Bank Paribas, a $9 billion fine. We didn't do it as a mediator. We just went in. We're using, we've got more drone strikes now than ever before. We're not mediating with drones. We're just going in. Special forces, same thing, right? Cyber surveillance, same thing. We're not using NATO for cyber. We're just doing it. Ask Merkel. Right? She's an ally. I'm using cyber against her. So I actually think, and this is not because Obama's a committed unilateralist. Again, he still talks a great multilateral game. But the fact is that the tools of US coercive diplomacy that are becoming so much more effective are unilateral tools. It's not about basing agreements in NATO and troops all over the world that you need allies for. It's cyber, it's drones, it's banks, it's the weaponization of finance that you don't need allies as much for. And that's a problem because that's an entire change from like the way the United Nations and Bretton Woods world. So I, I really fear that the role that you suggest 
is going to become vastly harder for the Americans to actually implement precisely because the road, the easy road of getting things done when we decide we want to get them done is exactly the opposite of that. But it's a fantastic question. I, I really mean that. Uh, there's a question, who was the one that the next one? We've got a lot now, which is good. I'll answer them more, I'll try to answer them faster now, just unless they're all that good. Um, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your time here tonight. Um, as someone who works for a bank and lived in China for a few years, I really am listening to what you're saying about both the money ball and the independent uh, point of view. And I see synergies, but I also see in China where you have an authoritarian uh, you know, state-run capitalism like you've seen in Singapore or South Korea or any other place. And when we talk about that and its applications in the United States and its comparison and how we could potentially go out, um, you also talked about how you, Washington's broken and we all know the problems we have in Congress. Do you think we could be effective in actually um, furthering our foreign policy goals using economic means beyond just the weaponization of finance, and even if we can continue that, uh, if Congress tries to assert more authority. So, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the state capitalist point because it's so interesting. You know, you think about the creation of um, Cyber Command and how that was done despite you know, sort of all of the brokenness in Congress. And you look at the fact that as of two hours ago, it looks like America was completely unaware of Chinese attacks to get four million U.S. government workers full records for over a year. As of today, over a year. That's astonishing. We've underestimated all this stuff. Um, the ability of the Americans to react and move when something is a national security issue is pretty significant. I mean, we're a free market economy. We're not a state capitalist economy. But we were more than happy to rope AT&T and Google and all of those IT, IT companies in directly to support the US government when we felt like we actually needed them for national security purposes. They've become a strategic sector. IT has become a strategic sector in the US. It's become industrial policy. We'll never talk about it that way. Now, if cyber gets worse from the Chinese, from the Russians and others, do you not think the Americans are going to actually pursue a policy that is very intrusive in terms of coordinating with U.S. corporations for the purposes of American national security, broadly defined? I think they will. In fact, I think that the economic statescraft speech that Hillary gave at the beginning of her period as Secretary of State and never actually implemented would probably be a piece of that. And it's worth reading if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we will move a bit in that direction. I think there are ideological reasons in the US that we will be very resistant to it, because it, it feels very non-free market. But then again, you know, we're a country that loves privacy more than almost anybody in the world, but we give it away freely, um, you know, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and yes, more to companies than to the government, but a lot of what I'm talking about, the companies would be fronts for the government, which is interesting. And the fact that the Pentagon just opened a big office in the Bay Area, specifically to hire two-thirds private sector, one-third public sector to work together and respond to this thing, and they're going to have as much money as crisis. Um, I, I, don't, I, I think this is an area that if the U.S. feels like they want to promote, I think it'll be hard for Congress to get their nose into it and say, no, we're going to slow you down. Very, very different from a lot of the other policies we're talking about. But again, that doesn't mean that we're going to have a leader that's going to come up with that strategy and actually implement it. But I think there's more flexibility and more room to hope. And also, look, this is a country which has done a lot of things historically. I, the idea that we just disempower ourselves by saying, well, that could never happen. And I'm as guilty of as anybody else, but at the end of the day, when America's threatened, we can make a lot of things happen. I mean, as, as broken as Congress was, after the 2008 financial crisis, you saw Congress move damn fast. As partisan as Congress was, and it was much more partisan than it was before then, they moved damn fast. And Bush got it done, and Obama got it done. And we can look back on it now and say bad decisions were made, but nonetheless, the US is not Europe. We don't have to worry about dozens of different parliaments with different electoral cycles and the rest. There is an ability to react when something is a strategic priority. So the question is, will this be seen as a strategic priority? That's an interesting question. One of the reasons I ended up picking independent is because so much of the geopolitical dangers in the world are not affecting the United States. ISIS is a problem. It's a big problem, globally. It's a small problem for the US. It exists, but it's a small problem. And I also have to say, a bit of morality comes in for me here. I, I know that Americans are more important than other countries. 
uh, right, the people. I get that. I get that our families matter more than other people's families. That all makes sense. My hometown is more important than yours. I, I get it, and I even believe it. I feel it. Everyone feels it, right? But when it comes to two Americans beheaded by ISIS compared to 250,000 Syrians dead after four wars, and we talk about ISIS JV team and Assad Moscow, we don't do anything, then we all know our, our, our spidey sense tells all of us that's really wrong. Um, and and that, that's when we need to take a step back and say, okay, how did this get so broken? What happened here? How did we care? We know we care less, but how do we care that much less? How do we get that isolated from the issue? That's, that's an interesting question that I would like to see our candidates actually address. Let's uh, start in the back there, sir, with the green shirt and the tie. And then I'll go over to the side. But I think, you know, until you kick me out, I'm here, right? How concerned are you that the a US, will, a U.S. dollar will lose its status as the world's reserve currency? And if that were to happen, what would be the ramifications for uh, the American standard of living? I'm not concerned at all in the near term. Because um, the volatility, the concerns about, I mean, think about who's going to think about the euro as a reserve currency in the next two years? You don't know if Britain's in, right? You don't know if there's a Greek deal. And even when there is one, you don't know if there's another one in six months' time. Um, you know, you, 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 you worry about the next Charlie Hebdo incident, but larger. Um, you worry about Russia, which is going nuts and is right there, and half of them don't seem to care. That, no one's going to talk about the euro as a reserve currency in that environment. And you know, China, it's going to take time. I mean, they're building the structure, and they're getting legitimacy, but they're very far from having a reserve currency that's going to threaten the American dollar. So what I see happening is actually a geopolitical environment that's much more unstable, the dollar continuing to pick up strength until it doesn't. And there are lots of things that could make it not. Some of them could be big disasters, like a massive cyber attack, or you know, sort of a horrible, you know, sort of a, um, uh, other other form, you know, t other form of terrorist attack on U.S. land, which I think is not usually likely. But there are black swans that you know you at least consider. But then, but some of it is what happens when the Europeans actually start to look more stable which over time will likely occur. Uh, what happens as the Chinese do actually uh, float the RMB, um, and as they become the largest economy, and people actually really go to them? What happens when there are, and, and even virtual currencies become more important, and non-state actors become more relevant? The ability of the Americans to maintain this level of dominance of reserve currency is almost certainly going to erode over the long time, but it may erode precipitously if the U.S. mishandles China, or if the U.S. abdicates badly. Um, and so, and, and would that affect, yeah, there was a book written by uh, Barry, help me, Eichen Green, Eichen Green uh, called The Exorbitant Privilege, which I think is probably the best, it's the best book I've read on this issue that talks about if the U.S. dollar loses reserve uh, currency status, the impact that would have directly on the American economy and on the average American uh, um, uh, citizen. Um, Terry Checky is here from the New York Fed. Is there a better book that was written on that recently? That's the best one? Okay, so that, you heard it from the expert. That's, that's actually the best book to read. Um, one was over here. You, sir, in the back. Yep, and then you. Yes. Here. Um, well, you can yeah. just get the, get the mic because it'll be easier for everyone. I mean, I'll hear you, but they might. Okay, so uh, sorry, too loud. Um, you mentioned Gorbachev in the mid 1980s. Um, it strikes me that Putin is very different not only than Gorbachev, than most of the Soviet leaders for like the last 40 years. He came out of the KGB, East Germany. Um, Gorbachev was hopeful he could save the system, the Russian Soviet economy. Yeltsin was hopeful. The Russian economy is doomed, and you know, the surveys from about NATO members. NATO doesn't look so strong. It seems as if the Europeans have enormous problems because the Russians are acting as spoilers and they can play a lot of very nasty tricks like they did in Ukraine and Georgia and even Estonia at this point. So it doesn't seem like the NATO security is offering much security and the United States unfortunately probably doesn't have an interest to risk getting entangled with the world's largest nuclear power even though we're more powerful. So it strikes me that the Russians are incredibly dangerous at this point in time, because they're acting as spoilers far more than the Soviets. The Soviets accepted the division of Europe. The, the Russians do not. They're very angry about the division. And uh, pulling Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania out of NATO and making them neutral is not going to make the Russians happy. So there seems to be 
enormous threat to the stability of Europe and just things that would really shake, as you said, the euro. And just as a little thought about Iraq, it seems like we got out Saddam Hussein. He wasn't the counter to Iran that people seem to think now. He tried to invade Saudi Arabia, and we seem to have gotten entangled in the stabilization effort. And that's where we seem to have gotten ourselves into deep trouble. And Iraq was very bad under Saddam Hussein, bad afterwards. I'm not sure we had to be totally in charge of Iraq afterwards, regardless of what happened. What's the Russia question? The Russia question is, how do we deal with it? It seems like uh, Russia's completely— How do we respond? Okay, yeah, I it's it. Not, it doesn't seem right. like it's completely contained. No, of course it's not completely contained. Um, again, it's not clear to me that the way you respond to Russia is by saying we're going to isolate you when we can't. I mean, the problem is that Russia's too big to isolate. Putin is too big to isolate. He's too powerful. It's not just about nukes. I mean, it's just the economy is too large, and other countries are prepared to act against American interests very strongly. I don't even think we can maintain Europe for much longer. In I mean, it was very hard to get them to support another six months of sanctions. The Germans are on board, but the Italians are not. The French are wishy-washy. The Hungarians are not. The Greeks are not. The Slovaks are not. I mean, this is going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. Um, I agree with you that Putin's a spoiler. I think he has reason to be a spoiler. Um, I think that he feels lied to on NATO enlargement. He feels lied to on East European missile defense. He feels lied to on energy exploitation of his backyard in the Caspian. He feels lied to on Ukraine. I think we mishandled Ukraine. Um, I think we mishandled it badly. Um, so one way that we could get we could manage this was by by stopping that. Um, I mean, we we probably punished. We put 80 percent of our effort on Ukraine into punishing the Russians and 20 percent into helping the Ukrainians. I think that's exactly wrong. Should have been 80 percent helping the Ukrainians and 20 percent punishing the Russians. Really provide the Ukrainians the economic support they needed, even if that meant that a piece of their territory was going to effectively be a confederation um, and that they weren't going to have you know, any veto authority over it. OK. I mean, I don't like it. But if the Europeans aren't with you, you're going to have to accept them things you don't like. And yeah, it's not exactly according to international law, and neither is Crimean annexation. But then again, neither was Kosovo's independence. And we didn't care about that. We are more than happy to accept abrogation of international law when it serves our purposes. Why can't we accept that it should serve other people's purposes sometimes? I think that's OK. I don't like it, but th politics are messy. You know, this isn't, this, this isn't poli sci 101, you know? Um, so it's on a two by two grid. Um, and so um, I, I think the way you manage, look, I actually think Kissinger's pretty good on Russia, right? Because, I mean, in many ways, dealing with the Russians is not so different than dealing with the Russians when, when Kissinger was Secretary of State. It is, it is still, you're right, they're more of a spoiler now, but when they became more of a spoiler because um, they, were, they, were, they were allowed to feel that America was supporting their decline. Was, was promoting their decline. And Pew just did a poll two days ago, they announced in Russia, and everyone would say, well, yeah, Putin's a 85% approval ratings, but that's not real, those are Russian polls. So Pew did a poll, 88%. <laughs> what the hell are we doing wrong? That after a year and a half of sanctions, 88% support for Putin? That shows you your policy is wrong. Right? It's not working. We're pushing the Russians towards China and emerging markets. We're taking the hit, and it's not helping the Ukrainians at all. Meanwhile, if you were a billionaire that had a chocolate factory, the Ukrainian president, and you had never worked in politics before, and suddenly you are shoved into this position, and you're trying to do what you can to run this place, and the Americans come over and they say, we are going to help you, and this really matters, and you're talking on the phone to the president, and the vice president comes over, and the head of the CIA comes over, and the se secretary of defense comes over, and we're wagging our finger at the Russians, and we invite them to, to, to go to the NATO summit. We say, we can't let you in, but you can come visit the summit. I mean, you could be forgiven for believing the Americans were actually going to support them and they should fight the Russians who were invading their sovereign territory. I, I'm sympathetic to that. I think we shouldn't be leading these people on, right? Don't screw around. If you're going to help the Ukrainians, help the Ukrainians. If you aren't, say sorry. And the problem is that we never want to give a bad message to anyone. We just want to kind of screw them later when it's quiet, right? <laughs> That's not right. Um, and I think that what's happened in Ukraine is partially on us as a consequence of that. I think what we should be doing is that Ukraine cannot just be a member of the EU Association Agreement. It has to be EU Association and it has to be Eurasian Economic Union. And the IMF fully supports that, though they can't really say it publicly. Um, but uh, the Americans and the Europeans haven't pushed for it. 
it, you, you're going to have to slice the baby. And that's an ugly thing to say about a country that, de that would desperately want to join. But I got to tell you, the Ukrainians are in such bad shape right now. They actually appointed the former president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, to run Odessa. The single guy who, is, who Putin would most want to hang by his toenails, right? Have you ever heard of something so incredibly idiotic? Um, I mean, my good friend Evo Dalder, who runs the Chicago Council and has been one of the most outspoken and thoughtful about needing to get behind Ukraine, after that we were playing tennis, he's like, oh my God, I can't support this anymore. That's just sad. But we were complicit. So this is one where it's not like I think Putin's a good guy, but I think that America got way over our skis. We, did, we were not mediating. And we've gotten ourselves in some trouble. And now we have to find a way out. Kerry's trip to meet in Odessa with Putin for four hours was good, but FIFA now blowing up probably is going to undo all that anyway. So what do you do? Uh, sir, I promise you next. Excuse me. I said I was going to have shorter answers. I've not been good at that. I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm really sorry. So I haven't read your book yet, but uh, based on what you've said so far, I would probably uh, align myself most with your independent uh, scenario. Um, and under all of these scenarios, maybe especially the money ball scenario, but I think under all the scenarios, to what extent um, would the outcomes be dependent upon existing levels of debt and capacity to take on additional debt in terms of power, you know, uh, shifts in the balance of power? Oh, I think, I think they all will, of course. There's no question that if the United States is, finds itself in a market environment, then we can no longer take on significant debt, then life is very difficult and our, and our policy options are constrained massively. I just don't see us as realistically in that environment anytime soon, and therefore, I think now we have choices. But yeah, I mean, you know, if you don't deal with the debt eventually, the debt will eventually crush you. Um, or you'll have to find other creative ways to get around it. Now let's also be clear, I'm not an economist. There are economists in this room, right? I've identified one, there are others, I see you. Um, but, but I am a political scientist and I want to say that, you know, there are lots of ways that you can have leverage in terms of getting countries to do what you want to support your dollars. Some of them are economic, some of them aren't. Right? I mean, the Japanese right now have an awful lot of support for the U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries. Let's imagine a situation where down the road the U.S. really mismanaged our model and the Japanese started saying, damn, we need to put that money someplace else. And that was really going to potentially hurt us. And then we go to Japan and say, damn, I guess we're really not going to support you on cyber or the bases or the security treaties that you really need. And the Japanese say, damn, I guess I really misspoke a couple of moments ago. I mean, I think that you can have conversations that are much less polite if the Americans start getting a little desperate when we have economic problems, but we have asymmetric capabilities in other areas, which we will probably still have. I think that's interesting. And that is a reason, by the way, if you think the Americans are very likely to seriously mismanage economically, you might actually want to double down on some of the defense stuff, simply for that reason. Because it's an area where the Americans are going to continue to have a very large advantage. And kinetics still matter, because Putin, right? Because, you know, China right now, fine. But China in five, 10 years time, not so sure, right? So life gets interesting. I would rather be making big bets on new technologies than making bets on lots of like, you know, brute military force. But I also recognize that there is some overlap between those two things. And, uh, and also that, uh, that you're going to have lots of different political players and lots of vested interests that will have things to say about that issue. So it's an interesting question. Uh, back there, sir. And then there. Ian, thanks for your remarks uh, so far this evening. Um, just a couple questions. The first is, in light of the fact just that- Just a couple. Just a couple, <laughs> not five. Just a couple, okay. Just but couple. they're related. Okay. So given the fact that some of the national borders that are the center of how you put your thesis together regarding, regarding the three models are really creations of uh, stemming from World War One and World War Two. Yep. Um, you know, how does that factor, uh, given that, you know, ethnic groups were divided kind of arbitrarily, whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in Africa, yeah. uh, and how we decide to use the three different models you're talking about in that context. And then also, the last question is, in terms of energy independence, how does that inform the three models that you're putting forward? Or the so, three well, energy independence very clearly speaks for independent America, right? I mean, that's fairly obvious. Obvious. I mean, we have a situation now where the Saudis are very angry because the Americans are not acting towards the Saudis as we acted when life was very different. 
And, you know, I mean, and part of the reason is because we're continuing to say we're going to support you, we're going to do all this stuff, but in reality, we're not. I mean, Saudi Arabia just is not as useful an ally for America going forward. And they're going to be even less useful as their economy implodes. I mean, if oil stays at 50 for the year, the Saudis will need to go through about one sixth of their reserves in 2015 their cash reserves. Now, they still have plenty of cash. They've got almost a trillion, right? But th they're going to stop spending on stuff soon. And if I look at the next three, five years, they spend on three things, domestic needs, security, and international aid in the region. Which one goes first? Right? Exactly. So I'm not short in Saudi, but my God, I'm short in Lebanon and Jordan and places like that. I'm very worried about that. And so you're going to see more failed states. And the Americans are just going to be less interested. And why are we doing an Iran deal? Well, because the Iranians are going to produce 1.2 more billion million barrels a day within a year of doing a deal. That is an unmitigated good for the United States. Lower oil prices. OPEC gets destroyed. We like that. Saudi doesn't like that. Well, that's because the US and Saudi Arabia aren't aligned very much anymore. We're aligned on some things, but not that many. The US and Israel, more aligned than US and Saudi Arabia, but not as much as we used to be. The Israelis no longer support a two-state solution. I don't necessarily blame them. I mean, in the sense that they used to need Palestinian labor. They don't anymore. It's automated, right? The service sector doesn't need it. Um, if I look at um, the, the, the Palestinians can no longer credibly threaten a third intifada against Israel because they've been walled off. They can't get in. They can't attack. So the left wing in Israel no longer talks about a two-state peace process. They talk about progressive social and, and economic policy. Um, America wants a two-state solution. Well, I guess that means the U.S. and Israel aren't as close allies as we used to be. We, I don't know if you want to say that publicly, but I'll say it publicly. I mean, that's clearly going to affect the relationship. It is affecting the relationship. It will continue to. So energy independence matters. Um, the, uh, the first question I'll answer quickly. I mean, I won't do it justice, but I mean, I, I, I don't fetishize borders. Um, I, I mean, Iraq is no longer a country. I understand that. Uh, Syria is no longer a country. I understand that. ISIS operates in Iraq and Syria. We have an Iraq strategy, and we don't really have a Syria strategy. But ISIS doesn't really care if we only have an Iraq strategy, not a Syria strategy, because they can operate in both. I think we kind of need an ISIS strategy that isn't an Iraq and a Syria strategy. And the more we recognize these states don't exist anymore, the easier that will be. Now, unfortunately, because we're still working with the Iraqi government and the Iraqi army, which our Secretary of Defense says doesn't have the will to fight, it's probably not the useful thing to say, but it's true. And it's because there is no really Iraq. There's no loyalty to an Iraqi central thing. There are Kurds, they are Shia. They're also Sunni, but we don't have many inroads there right now. We're not prepared to really work with the Iranians, which means we can't do much with the Shia. And the Kurds have taken back their territory, and that's fine for them. So yeah, I, I firmly expect that Iraq is just going to fragment. And uh, whether or not, at what point we decide to more formally recognize that, I think, is an open question. And we'll see lots of places along those lines where borders will no longer function. Boko Haram in Nigeria is another one of those places, yeah. Now, how, how much more time do we have, by the way? Hey, one more question. Can, can, I, can I do a speed round where I answer each question with one sentence? Sure. OK. Can you guys now give me questions that are actually literally in one sentence, and I'll answer them in one sentence, and I'll, I'll do all of them? Can you do that? Can you do it? Can you do it? Yes. OK, do it. Okay. One sentence. Uh, how does the independent model counteract China um, when it's just like the US being a city on a hill versus China is like actually on the ground, especially in emerging countries like Africa? <laughs> Don't give me five clauses. <laughs> how was, I didn't even get, how would, can America? Uh, in the independent model, how would it counteract China? China. Yeah. Yeah. In the independent model, America counteracts China by the Chinese aligning more with the US uh, because the values and the market is so much more attractive. You don't counteract it. Next. What values do you think should underpin American foreign policy? Uh -huh. um, what values? Openness, accountability, consistency, I want to give
give you one more. I'm gonna stick with those three. I'm gonna stick with those three. Yeah. Just yell them out, it's only one okay. sentence, I don't care. How, yeah, okay, sorry. one short sentence. How do you get anyone to adopt your 15, 20 year strategy when we live in a four year presidential cycle and a 24 hour news cycle? Um, eight years, one president, you can do an awful lot. Um, and and I, think, I, I, I think that um, setting up, the world is changing so much in the next eight years, setting up a big strategy and implementing can actually move the boat quite a bit. Take your point. Yeah. Just um, real quickly, uh, the, the dimensions at work with technology have changed the game so much, and if you could expand on that and how. Technology um, is leading to consolidation of states that are authoritarian for surveillance, decentralization of consolidated democracies where the center is more broken but there's flexibility, and is breaking down those countries that are neither strong enough to be consolidated authoritarian states nor stable enough to really have decentralization. That's what I would say. What, did you, what do you think we accomplished in Iraq, and when will we stop spending money in Iraq? I, I think that um, we accomplished extraordinarily little uh, aside from the removing um, of the Hussein regime, and we will continue spending money in Iraq in indirect ways, most importantly on um, the wounded soldiers that have come back to the U.S. for decades. How do you think the United States should deal with a more assertive China aiming to uh, establish hegemony in the Western Pacific and especially South China Sea? I would, um, I, I would respond more assertively on the military side because I believe they will not escalate as Ash Carter has started to do in the past several weeks. Uh, Ian, Jeff Hill, we, we emailed on Peepers, I won't go there. Someone just covered the, the China, South, the South China Sea. One sentence, question. <laughs> what happened in China with the largest maritime disaster in the history of the Communist Party, and they were able to shut down all the news about this, but I would imagine domestically, uh, people are very upset. Uh, I, I think support for the Chinese government on average is higher in China than support for the U.S. government in the United States, despite the fact that they are an authoritarian regime. That is instructive given their history. Very quickly, and to link it to the military uh, argument, uh, you seem to believe that the U.S. will remain a military power for the next uh, you know, 15, 20 years. There's this new book called 100, uh, 100 Year Marathon uh, by this Pentagon expert saying, that China will, in fact, challenge the U.S. One sentence. This is not a one-sentence question. You can expand on, on, the, on, the, on the U.S.'s military superiority in the next uh, two decades. If I can expand. Um, America's military superiority will shrink in asymmetric types of conflicts like on cyber. But when I think about traditional naval uh, missile, space, and other capabilities, I think that the U.S. lead is much more than 10 years, and will remain so. Please advise us on the sources of the best foreign affairs reporting. What oh. do you read? Where do you get your... Uh, I, I, the Economist and the FT remain the best regular uh, reporting that's broadly accessible, and beyond that, it's um, literally hundreds of public intellectuals and journalists from all over the world that either work for me and Eurasia Group or that are friends and are connected, social and the rest. Yeah. Greece. Uh, <laughs> uh, short term deal and then more of the same. <laughs> Which immigration policy will impact our economy the best? immigration policy. Uh, record numbers of Chinese and Indians coming to the U.S. even more than Mexico now want to be educated here. We need to keep them here after they're educated. That's critical. 
How do we get a U.S. foreign policy that's neither Republican nor Democratic or food for America? Elect John Huntsman? Uh, I'll stick with that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's a good way to end it. Thank you all very, very much.